According to Matthew, Jesus goes into the desert with the express purpose of being tempted by the devil. While Jesus is fasting, a battle is brewing. Although Herod was Jesus' first human adversary, the true foe is now revealed to be the devil, or, as he is later referred to, Satan. To indicate that Jesus is specifically tempted by the devil, the this is a major battle, as the ruler of the kingdom of the air attempts to halt the advance of God's kingdom. The picture we see here is consistent with the picture we see elsewhere of Satan's strategy. The enemy will not launch a frontal assault. Instead, he will try to divert attention with a series of temptations. The verb pyrazo, which can mean I tempt or I test, is the root of the word tempted. A temptation is an enticement to go against God's will, as Satan will try to do to Jesus. A test attempts to persuade a person to be faithful to God's will, with the hope that the person will pass the test. James chapter 1 verse 13 New King James Version Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Scripture is unmistakable that God never tempts anyone to do evil, but God does use events to test a person's character or resolve with the deliberate intent of fostering good ends. Satan intends to persuade Jesus to go against the Father's will, but in the midst of those circumstances, the Father turns Satan's evil intention to good by strengthening Jesus for his messianic role. In other words, Satan does not act independently of God, because God is in control of both the tempter and the circumstances. He will never allow a person to be tempted beyond what he or she is able to endure. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan approaches Jesus, and Jesus blocks those temptations. We can see a pattern that is shown regularly in Jesus' ministry. This pattern is also necessary for our own opposition to temptation. The first words of the tempter express the nature of the temptations. If you are the Son of God. This critical phrase reflects the tempter's general purpose to manipulate Jesus. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The voice from heaven recently confirmed the identity and the relationship to Jesus as my son, whom I love. Satan does not challenge Jesus' identity as the Son of God, nor is he attempting to get Jesus to challenge it. Rather, he is attempting to get Jesus to misuse his prerogatives as the Son of God. He is suddenly playing on Jesus' identity, almost flattering him, in order to dupe him into going against the Father's will for the Son. Why should you go hungry if you are the Son of God? Just turn those stones into bread, which you can do, and feed yourself. The tempter appears to be suggesting. Jesus is capable of performing such a miracle because he later miraculously multiplies loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 and 4,000 people, respectively. But it is not God's will for him to miraculously acquire food here. Jesus has come to live a truly human life, one that includes the normal means of food acquisition. Turning the stones into bread would have taken Jesus outside of the Father's will, 
for the Son's incarnational experience. Temptations are one of the ways the enemy attempts to persuade a person to go against God's specific will. As a result, a temptation is not always attempting to persuade a person to do something inherently sinful. Making stones into bread is not inherently wrong. However, the Father's will for the Son at this time is for Him to fast rather than eat. As a result, transforming stones into bread will lead Jesus astray. The real question is, what is the Father's will for the Son? Jesus responds to Satan by quoting a Deuteronomy. This shows the association between Jesus' temptations and Israel's wilderness experience. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, New King James Version. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these forty years in the wilderness, to humble you and test you, to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, Moses reminded the Israelites that God had led them through the desert for forty years to humble and test them. Hunger and God's miraculous provision of manna were two of the tests. That test was designed to teach them that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God's mouth. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, New King James Version. So, he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and feed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That is the lesson Jesus is now quoting in response to Satan's temptation. Israel should have taken God at his word that he would provide for them, even though they were in an area with no obvious means of feeding so many people. If it was God's will for them to be there, they had to believe him when he said he would look after them. The first temptation attempts to strike at the heart of Jesus' personal faith in the Father's leading. Even though his current circumstances appeared to contradict the voice declaring his status as the Son of God, whom the Father truly loves, Jesus maintains that the essence of life is trusting God's word. He does not need to turn stones into bread to prove his identity or to meet his needs. The Father has declared him to be the Son. The Spirit has led him into the desert, and he will not go against the will of the Father. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. If the first temptation attacks the individual life of the Son in relationship to the Father's will, the second is an attack on the Son's national responsibility. The devil transports Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, and places him on the temple's highest point. Satan approaches Jesus again with the words, if you are the Son of God. But this time, he quotes from Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12, where the psalmist asserts God's protecting care for the faithful in Israel. Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12, King James Version. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. The devil tempts Jesus to fall from that high place so that his loving Father can send angels to rescue him. Jesus is capable of doing whatever the devil tempts him to do. Later in Matthew, just before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus says that if he wanted, he could ask his Father to send more than twelve legions of angels to rescue him. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. New King James Version. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. First, Satan is attempting to put Jesus in danger. By doing so, Jesus would be inappropriately testing his father's love, attempting to manipulate him into sending a rescue force of angels. Such demands are not made by true faith. Jesus is being pressed to confirm his relationship with the Father. Does the Father really love him? Prove it by sending help. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8 through 10. Not only do the temptations have personal and national elements, but now the devil reveals a universal dimension as well. He takes Jesus to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and then makes an astounding offer. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. What a cruel enticement. Those kingdoms are the very reason Jesus has laid aside his own glory. His ultimate purpose is to gather the nations into the kingdom of God. But before he sits on his royal throne, he must hang on the cross. So the devil offers a shortcut. Jesus can bypass the ignominy of his human travail and the suffering of the cross. So Jesus emphatically declares, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In this response, Jesus exerts his rightful authority over Satan by issuing his first command and quotes for the third time the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13 through 15, NIV. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Jesus vanquishes him with a word. 